All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, today is yet another day for us to look into God's word. Um, is there anyone that wants to tell us anything that stood out from last week uh, studies? From anywhere? So why was the book of John written? The book of John was written so that we may know we may. that we have eternal life. life. You know, John put that at chapter five. But before you get to chapter five, John uses other parts to strip the believer. If you can withstand chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, and you do not run away till we go to chapter five, that means you're actually born again. For example, you know, we thought we have escaped. We know the Lord. We believe the true Jesus. But last week's teaching, the little thing we are still holding on to as self-pride, last week teaching broke it, yeah. shatters it. So the next, the next thing is maybe if you are offended by that truth, that is if you don't show up today, like Sister Rose more than showed up today, <laughs> perhaps you don't have eternal life. But if that last week teaching still may, didn't shatter you and you can still come today, you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. So John is not giving us a fake assurance. I'm writing that you may know that you have eternal life because you're not going to cram it. No, he's, he's cutting us. He's bruising us. He's wounding us. He's injuring us yeah. to see your endurance level if you will tolerate it or not. I must tell you, I teach the Bible, right? But last week class bruised me because I saw myself in that teaching. I put my I didn't know that unconsciously some things are in my mind that is giving me joy other than the scriptures. Yeah. But last week teaching exposed that in me. Don't ask me what is that thing, but it's me, it's me, it's between me and God. All right. So last week teaching really, really, really opened, did a surgery on me. So if all of us go through this journey, we get to chapter five, verses 13, and says, I'm writing that you be, that you know it's not just an empty promise. There's a surgery going on, and last week teaching was that surgery. So then, thank you so much, Brian Charles, for going through that route. Thank you, sir. Sister Senna, you raise your hand. <sighs> you are mute. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize there was something. Um, there were a lot of things too that stood out last week during the course of the week. Um, um, I also realized that um, in relation to a lot of stories and passages in the scriptures, like Lazarus, we might actually not get what we want here on earth. You know, there are some things like the 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 success we are looking for. We might the, the like how Brother Paul said just now that it's really caught. Like it just caught us, took us to the bottom of, of ourselves. Like God is more is more concerned with our um with our uh, spiritual, how do you say brother? It's more concerned about our spiritual spirituality than formation and comfort. Yes, yeah, character confirmation. So it's all about it's all about the will of it's all about the will of God and not us. So it, it's it's you might actually just like Lazarus. Lazarus died poor, so you might actually not get what you want here on earth. But at last, it's all about God. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Uh, any other person before we go ahead? One two minutes. Uh, for me, class? I wasn't there yesterday, but I listened. So okay. you know, what was stood out for me was that. In all our getting, we should get understanding concerning that God comes first in everything. For like maybe um, all these things, our eyes see the desires of our hearts. Anything that robs the desire of God has to be taken away and God's desire has to stand up. So anything that you are doing in life, in, you're doing in life, whether it's business or whatever it is, the desire of God should be to outweigh everything. Even if it's going to give you how many millions of pounds, whatever, the will of God and the desire to know him and to love him more has to be the paramount. And to me, it was something that really stood out for me. 
Thank you very much. The same thing applies to me. Uh, there are many things I held in high esteem. But in the course of the week, studying for it, I was questioning, I questioned myself more and thinking, wow. And that's why I didn't go beyond that. I said, it's just better for me to just deal with this and get it out. And on our prayer day, which is Tuesday night for North Americans and uh, for Europe and the rest of the world, it's on Wednesday. Um, a passage of scripture was read by Sister Sena, which is from Psalm 119. And I'm gonna read from 36. It says, give me an eagerness for your laws rather than a love for money. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. Reassure me of your promise made to those who fear you. Help me abandon my shameful ways for your regulations are good and I long to obey your commandments. Renew my life with your goodness. Wow. Lord, give me unfailing love, the salvation that you promised me. So if the psalmist is having confidence in the salvation that God has promised, that's exactly what John was writing about. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus, also said, don't love the world, neither the things of the world, that if the love of the Father is in you, you will not have room for the love of the world. So today, as we continue in 1 John chapter 2, and from verses 18, I'm going to read to the end. I'm only going to address three or four statements of John. Because the way John wrote, he would ask a question, then he would answer the question. However, because we were not his original audience, there are some things the original audience understood perfectly well that we, we, we have, permit me to use the word convoluted kind of knowledge that we may not fully understand pinpoint accuracy of exactly what he's talking about. So when John explains it, to them they understood and it was enough. But for us, there's a knowledge gap. In fact, for many people that have not never attended FOF, their knowledge gap can fill a whole vessel of sheep carrying containers to Africa. And it's not an insult to them. It's just that there are a lot of things that we really need to know. In fact, today's class took me back to F with the works of Christ. And you're gonna see why it took me back. Let's say a short word of prayer as we start. Father, Lord God Almighty, we have come again today. We are not tired. We have nowhere else we are going. We have nothing else we need to hear. We have nothing else we need to look or pay attention to other than to your words. Lord, let both the speakers and the hearers be blessed today. All of us, speak through me the exact things you want to emphasize to us. I'm just a mouthpiece. Everything I'm going to say, we are not my original thoughts. I read it from other people. Even the book we are teaching, I, we read it, inspired by you. Lord, let this be our portion today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's quickly dash into this. Um, today's class is not going to be long because those three, four points, if I'm really going to emphasize one a lot, is all we need to really pay attention to at this time. Because some of the things I would have talked about are more elaborate in the next chapter. So if it's going to be taught elaborate in the next chapter, I should just focus on what is in chapter two that is not talked about in chapter three. All right, first John, chapter two, I'm going to read verse 18 to the end. Dear children, the last hour is here, and you have heard that the Antichrist, capital A, is coming, and already 
many such antichrists, small letter A, have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches because they never really belong with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong to us. But you are not like that. For the only one has given you his spirit and all of you know the truth. I am writing to you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. 24. So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what it teaches is true. It's not a lie. So just as it taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. 28. Now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that, who, that all who do what is right are God's children. So in just reading this, you know, like I said, uh, I think two weeks ago, John writes very explicitly. He would talk about something, explain, go back to reemphasize in another way so that you don't miss it in any way. And let me quickly do a proof of that. Uh, in verse 20, he said, but you are not like that. Talking about the people that left, he said, for the only one has given you his spirit and you know the truth. By the time you jump to um, verses 27, but you have received the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of the Holy One. And he says, he lives within you so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. It's still the same thing, but telling you so you understand it accurately. Now, let's take this from verse 18. It talks about the Antichrist is coming. And already many Antichrists are here. In fact, this is the first explicit mention of the word Antichrist. And John is the one that used that term. But you see, in this uh, first John, I don't want us to be bothered about the Antichrist, the one that is coming. Why is it I don't want us to be bothered? We can't pray it away. We can't wish it away. It's an actual event that is going to happen. However, the Antichrist, uppercase A, is the fake dollar bill. The coming of the Christ, which is after the Antichrist, is the real thing. So we are better focused on the real thing than the fake one. However, our immediate danger lies with the Antichrists with S that have appeared today. They are here. You know them. Many of us have worshipped with them. And today, you are going to identify them by their deeds and by their words. Those are the ones you have to be concerned about because their job is one thing, to take your eyes away from Christ. And brethren, please listen to this statement very well. This might be the most important statement that will link to this teaching to last week. The moment your eyes leaves Christ, your eye is going to focus 
on the world. And the Antichrist is going to penetrate through the world system. He's going to rule the world. So brethren, there is no two ways. Once your eyes is not on Christ, you can't serve two master. It has to be in one place. Your eyes should be focused on the world. And once your eyes is focused on the world, the Antichrist is going to rule through the world. And you're going to be a slave to the Antichrist. So why John wrote about the world and immediately jumped talking to you about Antichrist is for this very reason. Because the Antichrist is going to be the champion of the world system. The world system is going to be submitted to him. So let us keep that at the back of our mind. So anytime the desires of the world is coming, be careful because that is a litmus test that you are putting yourself in slavery. All right. So now verse 19 says, these people left our churches but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong to us. What verse 19 is talking about, they are not like our brethren that left our Bible study or left your local church to another church. That is not what this is talking about. It's talking about people that left the true ecclesia, the true gathering of the children of God. But you know what? These people today now, they created a version of their own churches. They created their own gathering. Unfortunately for us, they also call it church. But these are not people that you just see left church A to church B. I'm not saying that church A or church B is the right kind of church. Don't mistake the two together. So your focus is not like your brethren that left your church, they moved to another city and start going to another church. These people departed from the assembly and they started a new gathering. And this will bring to mind what Matthew was talking about. The people, Jesus said, many that said to me, Lord, Lord. And these people is talking about, they say, Lord, we did miracle in your name. We did signs and wonders. How come he's saying, I never knew you? That's what John is saying. They were never with us. That is why they were able to go. Brethren, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. It is not you that put a rubber stamp on yourself as being born again. It is God. And what the Antichrist is also going to do is to put a seal on his people when he comes. People dominated by the world system already. So when they left our churches, they left, John is writing, they left the assembly because what the assembly offers was not enough. And we are going to see what John, how John is going to further explain about these people. Don't let us forget, he talks about in verse 18, and such many, uh, many such antichrists have appeared. From this, we know that the last hour has come. These people, these antichrists, they left. And let me quickly take you back to church history in Nigeria. If you read the book, there is a guy, uh, he, as a missionary came, mentored most of the people you can name in Nigeria today as of 2021 as the father of faith in Nigeria. He was their mentor. But many people departed from him because they found that the man, that's the book, The Messenger, by Abodunde Ayodeji Abodunde. Yes. So that man, many people left him because. They said he did not want them to manifest their gifts. Many people left because he told them, you don't have a reason to be in ministry. They left him because they felt he wants to restrict them. 
This is an example of these people left our churches. And these people that he's talking about, they are not just people that, uh, they are not, if you look at it, they are not people that will be like just ordinary people within the church. These people, yes, Rapo. Now, one of the people that left is the most prosperous church in Nigeria today. He met this man. He said he has a call to ministry. The man said, what's your call? He said, God called me to go and make people rich. He said, this man said, no, that can't be gospel. And he was angry and he left him. And he said, I will prove to you that God called me. So he went after and pursued money and he made money so much. And now he's proving God his point. Yeah. So, but because he's prosperous, he's successful in his own agenda, doesn't make it in any way to be part of us. So now, John quickly gave us comfort. He said, but you are not like that, the people that left. For the only one has given you his spirit and you know the truth. Keep the truth on your uh, left hand. We're gonna come back to talk about what is the truth. <laughs> Verse 21, so uh, the book is called The Messenger, the author is Ayodeji Abodunde. Uh, verse 21 says, so I am writing to you, not because you don't know the truth, again, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. So, you know, John has mentioned truth, and he has mentioned lies. But verse 22, immediately is going to define to us. And who is a liar? <laughs> but he didn't tell us what is the truth. We'll come back to that. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. That's one. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Oh, really? Verse 23, anyone who denies the son doesn't have the father either. But anyone who acknowledges the son as the father. So it's a package deal. The son and the father goes together. But anyone who denies the father and the son is an antichrist. You see, when you read this, your mind will skip many people because it says who is a liar, anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. So, and this is why FOF came into play. Is it just as simple as me saying that, oh, Jesus is Christ, I believe it. Just that saying makes me to be a follower? No. Because from man can say anything. However, the actions of man should be a proof in what they actually believe. So let us quickly take a look. John has helped us to define lies. So when he defined the lies that as anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, that is the lie. So the truth according to scripture is you knowing that Jesus is the Christ. So I'm sorry, I first have to help you to identify that Christ. What did Jesus say? I am the truth, I am the way, the truth and the life. That is how he defined himself. Brethren, anyone that tells you Jesus is not the truth, Jesus is not the only way, there are other truths, he is not the only one that gives life, identify that person immediately as what? Anybody? As a believer? 
Or as an antichrist? Antichrist. Antichrist. Anyone that tells you he is not the only way. Anyone, so what is the truth according to scripture? Anyone that believes that Jesus is the Christ. Saying that the man that does miracle money is a liar, is not saying is a liar. Or for me to say that, oh, the man saying miracle, preaching about miracle money is a liar. That is not the liar that the Bible is talking about. If I say that, oh, don't listen to that man. Uh, he's saying that miracle money is, 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 is demonic. Does that mean I'm saying the truth? No, that is not the truth of scripture. Saying that somebody is a false prophet, if I say that, that doesn't mean I'm saying the truth. What is the truth is for me knowing Christ as the Messiah. That is the only truth. And what is the Messiah? Who is the Messiah? What would the Christ do? Please, I can identify two to three teachers here that have taught about the words of Christ. So what has the Messiah come to do? Why is this um, very important? Why would this help us to differentiate between lies and truth? Why would this help us to identify the Antichrist? As simple as anyone who says Christ is not the Messiah, you are saying that is the Antichrist? Really? Let me give you an example. When Christ came, he took his robe. He took it off and wiped his disciples' feet after washing their feet. True or false? True. When he washed it, what did he tell them after that? He said that it is true love that you'll be identified as my disciple. If he, Christ, that came in human body, can humble himself to wash the feet of his disciples. Was the water supernatural? Please, we need to open our mic because this, you will not find yourself in a, in a wrong gathering any longer. And you will help people more to get out of uh, falsehood. Was the water supernatural? No. 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 The, the towel he used fell from heaven. No. no, his disciples were there people that were in high places in the society. No, no, because why the Messiah came in a human body. Now, if I term that to be a supernatural act, I am denying that Christ came in a physical body. Because we are trying to move him out of being a man that was God. We are trying to make him into what is not. You are already denying that Christ, humble as the Messiah. You are only looking for a superman to be your Messiah. Again, who is the way to heaven? Hi. Christ. Are we sure about that? Yes. But you remember yes. a popular man that said, when I take you to heaven, you will thank me. <laughs> you have identified another <laughs> Antichrist. Right there. Because he is the way to heaven. Let's quickly go to my favorite scripture. And I'm quickly telling you right now. This class will not be long because the main message is what we are talking about now. It's what you need to really know. Once you know it, because the, the difference between truth and lies is night and day. Hebrews 1, 1 to 2. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And in these final days, he has spoken to us through 
his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance and through the son, it creates the universe. So brethren, when I say to you, come next week and I'm going to lead you in prayers and all your destiny that has been tied down will be released to you. Identify me immediately as an antichrist. Because all things abide in the son. And when you have the son, you have the father. When you have the son, you have everything. Listen to Hebrews 1, 1 again. In the past, long ago, God in many times and in many ways spoke to our ancestors through the prophet. So when I tell you, come, and I'm going to tell you mysteries about God, I am telling you that the son that has spoken is not enough for you. And when I'm saying it's not enough for you, that means I am putting myself in place of that Christ. I no longer believe in as the Messiah. I'm helping us to expand that so we can have understanding. In fact, let me quickly now make you, what, what I've said, this will now make you understand why Paul was angry. Let's go to the book of Galatians chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you? For the meaning of Christ's death was made, you can see that Paul is not saying that Jesus' death. The Messiah's death, Christ and Messiah, is the same word in the original. Death was made clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Holy Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new life in the spirit, why are you trying to become perfect by all, all your own human efforts? So why is Paul writing with these words? Brethren, the truth, the truth, it's only about the Messiah, not about anything else. And these people that were even trying to follow Judaism, Paul called them to be foolish. So now, backtrack back to John. When John is telling us that you have the Holy Spirit, you don't need anybody to teach you what is true. You don't need anybody to teach you that Christ is the Messiah. He's already inbuilt in you as a believer. No teacher needed. It's the work of the Spirit by itself. John 14, 6. John chapter 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are other ways to God. I have other ways. Identify me immediately as the Antichrist. That means I no longer believe that Christ is the Messiah. And this is why I we turned away from a certain man that thought about you can know God by following truth in the society, by fighting for what is true. He didn't know what is true according to the scripture. The only truth according to the scripture is that Christ is the Messiah. That is the mystery that the prophet have been longing to, to discover long ago. That is all they were looking for. That is all they were trying to unravel. That is the only truth. So when John now is writing in 1 John, that you don't need anyone to teach you because you have the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about 
like Bible study we are doing. Because let me read this. I am writing, verse 26, I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. Their goal is to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit and it lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Holy Spirit, which you receive at the time of conversion, teaches you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know and what it teaches is true, not a lie. So just as it taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. You can now see that Paul, writing in Galatians, was angry and said, are you guys foolish? We were portraying Christ's death to you. It was a clear picture. You could see it clearly. Now you are saying there are seven ways to become holy. Mystery of holiness. And there's a certain antichrist now that is always teaching about mystery. The mystery of midnight prayer. The mystery of midday prayer. The mystery of uh, 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 aligning with the fathers. Wherever you see these things, you must know exactly who they represent and what they stand for. And when I call a meeting to gather, that power is going to change hands. From whose hand? I'm already in the hands of Christ. So from which hand is power going to move me to? From A to B? Maybe he has not read this Colossians. Because Colossians says we were translated, we were transformed, we were conveyed. See, when they set up a conveyor belt, anything you drop on the conveyor belt moves in the direction in which it is programmed. Even if a human being should fall on, you just try and jump on the conveyor belt that brings bad from airplane. You will find yourself in the terminal. Express route, nobody's going to check you. Because that conveyor belt has been set to carry luggages from the airplane straight to the baggage terminal. That's exactly what happened to us when we got born again. We were put on the conveyor belt. You can't fall from it. Because you didn't program it. You didn't put yourself there. We were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. We don't have problem with the big A Antichrist. He's coming, for sure. But who are going to program us to follow him? And when I tell you that this world, this material world, is created for your success, and you must get all you have, to show the glory of God. Brethren, I've just told you another antichrist. Because when they program to you all you need to get, your best life now, once you see that, it's telling you this earth is where your best life lies, not in heaven. Anything that changes your perspective of Christ as the Messiah, that the purpose of his death and resurrection is as it is written in the scriptures. And I'm sorry I'm going to blow your mind. Christ did not come to give you best life now. He did not come to give me my best life now. He came to give me my best life in eternity. And look at John defining to us what eternal life means again here. It says in verse 24, so you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life that he promised. How do I know? John chapter 17 and verse 3 will help us, and this will give you a new light. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, or Jesus the Messiah, the one you sent to earth. Why was that sent to earth important? Because he came as a man. He was hungry. He was tired. What does that mean? He did not come to eradicate sickness in this world. 
So when I tell you come to Christ and your sickness will be over, I have just lied to you. I am an antichrist. If I should tell you that come to you, uh, that poverty is a cause of the law in your life, I've just become an antichrist to you because I'm telling you, you must do all to get it in life, to get money, to get all material wealth. There is nothing bad in getting it, but it must not be all that you are aiming to get. A popular man built a magnificent building. And when he built it and he finished in the capital city in Nigeria, and he said that if you want to do, come to our conference and I will teach you success, how to do mega projects in the name of the Lord how to run successful ministry in the name of the Lord. And look at this statement. Lord, Lord, in your name, we have cast out demons. He said, I never knew you. Anyone promising you anything other than what Christ has promised, his only promise is eternal life. Go and search your scripture. His promises do not solve barrenness. His promises do not solve your marital problem. His promises does not solve sicknesses. His promises does not solve poverty. I'm sorry, this might break your heart even more, but we are believers, we need to get this. The only work of Christ is for salvation of our soul. Either you are lame in this physical world, in heaven you will not be lame. And there are too many antichrists sitting as head of churches all around, luring people, with best life now. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, not only on the earth. Don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you to be poor. Uh, in, I, used to tell, I used to consider myself a broke man, but in any economy of the world you put me to, I'm not broke. So don't get this message twisted. But the pursuit of wealth is never my no I used to tell, there's a man a year, I used to tell, I never in one day in my life set out that I'm going to be rich. All I'm just doing, diligent in my work. Once I'm diligent, the reward of diligence comes to me. And I'm, brethren, you talk of hard working, I'm not a lazy man. No. <laughs> but a poor year knows. Neither is he. With, with our language is analog. That means we are going to work hard and we are doing. So don't confuse that. Should I not do anything? That's not what I'm saying. I've never set out in my life. I used to tell my wife, did I ever tell you I'm going to be British? No. Did I ever tell you I'm going to uh, build houses? It's never in my promises. Not that we won't have it. I live in the house, I own the house I live in, praise God. But that was never my goal. And that is not the reason that Christ died for me. His death was for one purpose. And please, if you are listening to this message and the teaching on the works of Christ in FOF probably is not ringing bell in your head. You've never heard of it. You need to join. You need to find us for FOF those fast. And if you are here, go on our YouTube page, go and uproot FOF and go and digest it again. You remember two weeks ago, I talked about God's character and his attributes. And today I'm talking about the works of Christ. Why did he die? What did he die for? Why did he really come? Anything that gives you any other promises outside of this, brethren, is a message of the Antichrist. And they have one goal. Their goal is simple. They are just to lead you astray. It is your responsibility not to be led astray. You won't tell God, oh God, eh, but I didn't know I went to serve you. That's why I went to the church. He's going to bring, do you have a Bible? Have you read it before? The things they were promising you, could you find it there? The words, you see, the biggest problem that we have as believers, why these people could be able to lead us astray is because we are looking for something that is not. We are looking for mirage. You know, when you are driving on the highway, 
Mirage appears so real as water. But as you draw closer, there's no water on the highway. We are looking for what is not. And John is being careful. He says it's not because you don't know the truth. See, inside of your inside, is the problem, that we, we must, you must be really foolish to cooperate with prosperity gospel. That's so a seed, and God will multiply it. But in your, it's in the hand of the collector that is multiplying. I can sow it into my own life. Now. And let me say how God will multiply it. God in heaven, and I put a seed. It's a physical bank transaction that enters your pocket. You already multiplied from the day you got it. And I can tell you, it's, it's working better in the hands of Yahoo Yahoo boys. Because they tell you, they also use the same thing. There's a, low, there's a money locked up somewhere, but you need money to get it. You know the foolishness is greed. It leads everyone to them. For you to be duped by fraudsters, you must be greedy yourself. Looking for the things you have not worked for. So going back to our text, let me read the words of John again. He has helped us to define the liar. And when we look at it, we know what is the truth. That believing that Christ is the Messiah, that is the only truth that is referencing. And that's why Jesus himself said in John 14, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father. Anyone that tells you that just go and be doing charity, that through that truth, you will find God, is deceiving you, is an antichrist. Anyone that is promising you what the scripture does not offer, is an antichrist. And we must pay close attention to it because he spent more time talking about the antichrists than the antichrist itself. He said he's coming. That's one is no problem. But they are antichrists here. Their goal is to lead us astray. And they are going to break our fellowship with the son and with the father. And once that fellowship is broken, brethren, eternal life is no longer an assurance. It's no longer an assurance. Uh, in the book of John, I think cha John chapter 15, I will recommend that for everybody to go and read it again. Is the, you remember, is the abiding passage. I remember when Brother Paul was teaching it, he was using, a, we are going to the surgery table where God is going to do some pruning. I think many of us can remember in our story of John that the knife is going to cut, to prune, for you to bear fruit. It's, pain, it's a painful process to cut out the deaths, to cut out the, the branches, the, to prune it, to, for it to be, to be beautiful. It's a painful process for brethren that keeps us what? Abiding in the vine. And when you are not abiding in the vine, that you produce dead leaves, or you produce a different kind of fruit. And John is so concerned for us. He said he doesn't want us to be led astray. He said he's writing to us, not because we don't know the truth, we know it already. Don't be like the Galatians that were foolish. He said, but you have the Holy Spirit. You don't need anybody. In fact, you don't need to carry the scripture to read, to know the difference between truth and lies. Christ is the Messiah. But that simple statement is not all you need. What are the symptoms? What are the uh, fruits that they are presenting to you that will make you to know if what they are presenting you is the Messiah or is not? Because the moment you are not presented with the Messiah, don't let us deceive ourselves, brethren. Your eyes is going to be glued to the things of the world. And they're going to tell you, Mr. Senna, you know you are bigger than this. You can achieve more. 
when you look at it, that in your industry, the top industry, the top guy that you are looking at today, you can take their position. God can elevate you higher than them. You know what that is going to do to you immediately? You're going to look for ways. You're going to find divisive ways to rise. You'll get fresh energy. They call it, you'll be inspired. Inspired by what? We are never to be influenced through external stimuli. The Holy Spirit is a self-generating, uh, emitting inspiration and knowledge, but it's all within you already. It is not until somebody comes to sweet talk you that you now wake up that, ah, I can do it. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit gives us abilities. We didn't have to pray for it before he gives them to us. You don't have to sow a seed before God <laughs> gives you these abilities. You don't have to do anything. It's innate to us. And that's why John is saying, you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. That Christ is in desire. He died so that we can have life. And when someone is telling you abundant life, let me, abundant life ministries. Ah, which abundant life? Where is it coming from? Life beyond the, beyond the ordinary. In fact, the moment you hear some certain uh, titles, labels, don't bother to check the content. I remember from last week, anything other than the Christ is death and resurrection that leaves, gives us the way to life and godliness is going to glue your eyes to the world. That is a channel of the Antichrist. Don't subscribe to it. Throw away the decoder box. <laughs> Don't subscribe to it. The loss, that's why I had to read Psalm 119 again at the beginning, verse 36 precisely, because their whole goal, the whole agenda they have is contrary to what this psalm is saying. It says again, give me an eagerness for your love rather than love for money. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. It's eternal life. The psalmist also talk about it. Because it's salvation. And brethren, nothing must take our eyes away from this. I must tell you, don't live your life caring about sin, follow Christ, you will automatically sin less. I'm not pursuing holiness. It becomes my nature following Christ. But you see, our biggest problem as believers will be more of things of this world. Because the things of this world will what we eventually lead many believers into sin acts. You want to get it by force. So John did not leave us to be in any dark spots. I am writing verse 26. These things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit. You didn't get it. It's a difference between when you get something and when you receive something. You received it. And it lives in you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. It's inside already. It's in it to us. And knowledge, knowing God the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, is the only assurance of eternal life. 
Let us pray. Father, the way of life is just through you. And Lord, let our eagerness only be towards you. To love you and to love our neighbor. To pursue after you and to show love to our fellow brethren. To pursue after righteousness rather than the things that gives pleasure to our mortal bodies. Help our passion to grow more towards you, more and more. Let your Holy Spirit, let the voice of the Spirit be loud in our ears, loud in our spirit. Because he's always there speaking, but we don't always pay attention. He's a comforter whom you promise. We have it without a doubt. Because we are born again. Help us to yield more to the spirit than to the flesh. Let the fruit of the spirit be manifest in our lives. As a defense against the laws of the many antichrists in our world today. Working for the devil in disguise. Promising us channels through, who, through which the Antichrist is going to show up. Lord, we put our trust in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Let's get your contributions, questions, Amen. or comments. Thank you so much. Uh, let me raise my hand. Go ahead, man. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Brother Charles. This, uh, this is a heart searching message for me. And um, I must say, uh, God will continue to bless you guys for this opportunity to always have to share and to have the truth of the word of God. So, this first John 2 18 through 26 or 29. Uh, what really ministered to me from the beginning was how you were able to bring out the lighting, separating the Antichrist with the caps and the small letter Antichrist, which I believe for some of us coming from uh, a very bad background of a so-called spiritual journey, look, thinking that we can pray it out. But I like it when you said, the reality is that it's an event. The, the, that is the, the one, the upper case of the Antichrist. It's an event that is inevitable. It's coming. So we can't pray it out. No matter how we pray, oh, it's not going to happen. It's going to come. So this kind of prepare our mind as believers that it's an event that is coming. We should know where we are walking because the truth has been shown to us. And of the Antichrist, which is the smaller ones, you can see the S that is there. And the enlightenment you made that is here with us every day. It is what we, it is we continue to deal with the moment we remove our focus from Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. And uh, I, I'm really blessed with that. And also, uh, there are some statements that really touch me where you said, uh, my, my, my best life is not now. And this, I believe, is what most of us, we walk, 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 or run after because we're being known because we're being taught because we don't know the truth of the scripture that Christ is not come to give us our best life now, but it's for eternity. It's for the, it's for, it's for, that's why I said our eyes should be on the things that are unseen, the eternal things, not the ones that are now. But if you look at around us today, even believers, we are pursuing comfort that we cannot see that is outside of Christ. We are pursuing prosperity that is outside of Christ. We are pursuing peace that is outside of Christ. Everything we pursue, mm -hmm. oh, I want to do this. If it's boiled down to, to the uh, first John 2, uh, 17 to 19, we did last week, that the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is what is ruling the world today. And even believers is what is still ruling them. But 
this is a message that we, we keep on thinking, well, if my best life is not now, why should I go out ahead, killing myself, having sleepless night because I want to achieve when I know that Christ has given me my best life for eternity to come. Thank you so much. God bless you. I appreciate this message. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor <laughs> Edeji wants to say something. They will go to Brother Paul. Um, sorry, there's a little bit of noisy background, but I'll, quick, I'll do it quickly. Um, I just uh, look at uh, verse 21. And he said, I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of this. So the fact of the case is, how did he know that he knows it? How did he know that those people know it? How? Saying that, yes, I can tell you. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 31 and 34, when God was promising the Holy Spirit, Jeremiah, yeah, if you find it, you can read it. Jeremiah 31, uh, 34, I guess. They will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to <laughs> teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest, we know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. The fact of the case is that it's not us. It's not, it, don't know that they know it, because the spirit that lives in them will bring it out. Jesus said that he will remind you of everything that I have told you. See, there are children of God in those churches now. You don't, don't, they are children of God. But one day, they will really see this and their eyes will open because the Holy Spirit will really, really teach them. It's not going to be anybody. John is specifically saying this because he knows that these people have the Holy Spirit and it is the Holy Spirit that touched them, not he himself. Even the ones that you are saying today, it's not because you are saying it with eloquence, but because the Spirit is rising in within us and rewriting those words in the language we will understand, each of us will understand. And that is the, that, uh, that is the truth. Thank you for uh, uh, really, really, telling us signs, signs of uh, the Antichrist that are actually living now. Because all they want you to do is to live a lie. Yeah. You live a lie. The, uh, the way they do it is that we can manipulate God for you. We can manipulate, if you do this, this is why we have their God is always asking for something. And they always use lingos, all these lingos, just to attract men, not anything. Thank you so much. Thank and we you. thank God in your life, not in anything. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know, but just Paul and I used to make a, a fun that a believer can be deceived, but not forever. It's just for a short time. One day you wake up by yourself that, no, <laughs> never again. So, Brother Paul, go ahead. They will go to Brother right. Paul. Thank you so much, Brother Today's class is self explanatory. I just want to pick one, two things from it. Uh, it's clear. It's, I'm not teaching anything new. It's just clear. Um, you know, I want us to be more practical because the goal of, of this class is for us to be practical, that when you see this Antichrist, you will not be deceived. And get back to the text. Let's get back to the text. John, First John 2. Verse 21, John said, so I am writing to you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lie. You know why? He said, because you have an anointing. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Brothers and sisters, if you are born again, you are born of the spirit of truth, you won't be comfortable with the spirit of lies. So expecting something spectacular, you want to see you are, it's too far. You are late. You have come too late. So you're expecting that pastor to either have a conspicuous charm or, or we want maybe someone to uncover a dead body in the church. Or I had somebody saying yesterday that uh, somebody had a revelation. He saw a chauffeur on the altar of MFM. That is too late. 
It's too late. It's You've too gone late. too far. <laughs> You've gone too far. You don't need anything spectacular if you are born of the truth and the spirit of truth is in you. You will not be comfortable with lies. And every of these Antichrist guys always tell lies. But I guess and I have a practice. When you tell me, oh, San Francisco, for example, you told us now that there's a guy in town who will believe you. He's preaching well. Okay, we will play his teaching. It's, it won't be up to five minutes. He will have said like five lies in five minutes. You will know if you are born again. Five minutes is too much. There's once one he, man. Once you quote one scripture, <laughs> he's done. <laughs> no, there's one man that came one time in Abuja was wearing brown agbada and was talking about the fathers. We destroyed the we they destroyed the gospel. People began to share it. It went viral. Calm down. I went to his website, his YouTube. Looked at six months teaching. He's a liar. He's one of them. Apart from that one sermon that is good or that was good, every other thing he taught in the last six months was prosperity, breakthrough, healing. So, do you see? See, we are born of the spirit, and that spirit is the spirit of truth. Truth and lies are not comfort and cannot can't be mixed. So if you are born again and you are expecting the spectacular, it's too late. Let me give you another example, vestment. So when you say vestment, what is coming to your mind now is the, either the Sele rope, which is wrong, or the Anglican or the Catholic rope, which is wrong. What's a vestment? A vestment is a garment worn for a religious service. Apart from ironic priesthood, which has been closed, the next place you find vestment in the Bible, one place, is in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 22, and it's on the bar. It's the worshiper of bar that wear vestments. They put it in a wardrobe. Apart from ironic priesthood, and it's been closed. So today, if you see any priest or any pastor wearing white, 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 that's a vestment. You are expecting a spectacular. You've gone too far. He's wearing white, white, white. That's a vestment. Or even the redeemed guy wears short sleeve attached to him, short sleeve. It's a vestment. It's a vestment. Yes. Even your pastors that wear three piece suit, that's a vestment because they are dressing for the occasion. That's a vestment. They must always show up. <laughs> that's a vestment. Second Kings chapter 10, verse 22. That's the only place we find. Go to Google, type vestment. It doesn't exist except one place. Second Kings 10, 22. They're expecting something spectacular. So, the last point I want to pick out, I want it to be practical so that our eyes will be sharp, right? Uh -huh. Last thing I want to pick out here, John says something, verse 27. He says, I am writing, let me start from verse 26. I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit and He lives in you. So, you do not need anyone to teach you what is true, for the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what it teaches is true. It is not a lie. I've said that the spirit of truth and the spirit of light don't mix. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. But I just has done a lot of work on that. I just want to be practical. Now, if you remember two weeks ago, what I just taught us, verses 12, two weeks ago, it, talk, it spoke about little children, matured, and the fathers. You will always find these three categories in the church or in a fellowship of believers. Those who just came into the faith, John called them little children. He said in John, 1 John 2, 12, I am writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been, have been forgiven, not through you, through Christ. This is the elementary. Introductory to Christ is forgiveness of sin. This is elementary that every person who calls call himself a believer must know. John now moves to the next category of people. I am writing to you who are mature in the faith. And but I just taught us that one two weeks ago. What makes you mature is because you know the truth. He now went back to little children again. So you see that he's talking about, he's talking between groups of people. Verses for in the same verses 13, I am writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ. This is what makes us mature, knowledge of Christ, who existed from the beginning. He now moved to, again to young people. I am writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won the battle over the evil one. Verses 14, this is important. This is very important. I have written to you who are God's children. Who are the children? Elementary, elementary, those whose sins are forgiven. And who are those people? He said, I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. Really? 
the elementary stage of Christianity, Christianity 101. 101. God. That's it. Is the elementary, is the smallest elementary Christianity 101. So whoever comes today and is telling you that there's a deeper thing, deeper. Hmm. Let me tell you who will do departing, Antichrist. Yeah. Revelation 13 says, Antichrist will do signs. That one is like Jesus. Jesus did signs, right? John chapter 2, at the mind of Canaan of Galilee, this sign. And I said, Antichrist will call fire from heaven. Jesus did not do that one. Jesus didn't call fire from heaven. Antichrist will call fire from heaven. He's deeper than Jesus. When you start hearing things that are deeper, deeper mysteries, seven keys to this, seven deeper this, and they are so e everywhere. Righteous, please go on Google right now. Do a research for us. Just type anybody's name in your mind. You'll find their name. You'll find their teachings in the last three months. It's always depth, deeper, mysteries. There's something deeper, deeper, deeper. It is the Antichrist that will call fire from heaven. Jesus didn't do that. None of his apostles did that. That was deeper than Jesus. So the elementary beginning of a Christian journey is that you know God. Okay. But then, are you, are, you, are you ready? Are you share it for us on the screen. The next question is, Brother Charles, how do I deal with assurance problem? You are not the only one in NATO. <laughs> Salvation is instant. Assurance of our faith is not instant. That's why John is saying, you are mature because you know him. This is why we grow in the knowledge of Christ. One, dealing with assurance problem, you grow. Keep coming to fellowship. Because fellowship, there's a level of comprehension God grants in fellowship. It's deeper than when we study alone. So keep coming to fellowship. That will help your assurance. Also pray. Ephesians 1.18, pray for the spirit of revelation and our uh, spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Pray. Then number three, pick the Bible and read. Read for yourself. You can understand. If KJV is too difficult, go for NLT. <laughs> but I can't say NLT today. Simple and it's clear. Simple. So pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Pick your Bible and read yourself. Portion it. That's why FOF is good. FOF will teach you how to study the Bible. Portion it. If this is, if you want to read First John, read First John over and over and over and come to fellowship. I will tell you that I became simple because of Baba, not because I read it in the book. He hacked it out for us, and we learn it way deeper than reading the book. So God gives a level of comprehension in fellowship. Also pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, and also pick up your Bible for yourself and read. Assurance problem is ongoing and progressive. Particularly if we keep living in sin, your assurance is destroyed. Even though you are born again, you will be doubting your salvation. So, but I just didn't talk about sinless perfection. He's talking about sin, sinning less. Yes. <laughs> so if we walk towards that part, you pick up by yourself, you read, and you come to fellowship. Assurance should be growing. All of us, even me talking, there are times I'm afraid. <laughs> Even when I just talking, there are times we are defeated in assurance. But when we come to fellowship again, we get yeah, strengthened. We come to prayer. That's why I don't miss prayer. Because I realized that these things is ongoing. You say, it's just, last week, we were fired up, right? You don't come to fellowship for the next two weeks. Don't come to your, don't join prayer. You start seeing your assurance going down again. You yeah. come to fellowship again. Don't be on phone while we're in fellowship. I'm not saying Sarah's point is on phone. It's, that could be your Bible. <laughs> when you're in fellowship, be serious. You know, to help me to be serious, I bring out my picture. That way, I'm, you will know if I am distracted. I have down, I have canceled everything during Bible study time. It's Bible study time. Let's get it serious. Don't just come and mark attendance. Oh, we can see your name. Yeah, you know, Sister Han, Sister Han is there. It's, that's not, you are not marking attendance to us. We don't need your attendance. If you are here, be here. If you are not here, close it and go. When you have a time, when you have time, go and listen. listen. Uh, Ediri wasn't here last week. She has listened to it and she was talking about it, right? Uh -huh. See, that is how assurance comes up. In fellowship, in prayer, pick up a Bible and go. But if you think because you are doubting the assurance, you needed a chance to teach you something deeper. You have been deceived. Nothing deeper than what you already know. That's practical. So let me stop there. All right. Thank you. Let me, before we go to Braola and Bra Valentine, let me quickly do this. Thank you very much. Um, you know, there's uh, something that really stuck out to me uh, in as we were having this um, study. Uh, and it goes back to the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is very, very simple. And what is it? That Christ came in human form. 
He died to redeem man, and he gave us a promise. And that promise is eternal life. If we look at verse 25, it says, and in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. So if we remain faithful and we do everything that he has commanded, we will remain in fellowship with him and we will be able to appropriate that promise. It's a very simple message. But it's clear to me now that if the, that is the only message that you are preaching, you are likely not going to be famous. You are likely not going to have a large gathering. If you don't have a large gathering, you may not get that much offering. <laughs> because most of the world is actually looking for something different. They want miracles. They want something that so-called will make them famous, that will make them prosperous in terms of worldly standards. So in, in, the, in the attempt to try and enlarge their own garden, what have uh, false prophets, what have they done? What they've now done is they've expanded that message to now say, okay, um, if you want, you know, uh, God will give you everything you want, or, you know, he will make you prosperous in terms of being wealthy, or, you know, he will deal with your enemies. And what has that done? It has brought many people who have no business being in the, in the kingdom into that fold. And this is what we are seeing playing out and out and out. So if we keep just to that simple message that Christ came in human form, he died so that man could be redeemed. And if we believe that message and we follow him by obeying his commandments and doing the things that are that he has asked us to do, then we will appropriate that promise of eternal life. If you look at a lot of those messages, for example, that term, but just just showed us, you will see that the focus is not on the life to come. The focus is on how you can do everything now in this <sighs> present world. So that's their own focus. They are not looking at uh, you know, the life that is to come. And if that is their focus, that's why a lot of people that you will find in those gatherings are actually looking for things that will make them who they want to be and what they want to achieve now. That eternal life, that one is too far off. They are not concerned about that. And that's why most people will cut corners, you know, do whatever they can to be who they are not supposed to be in this world. That's their focus. Mm -hmm. And if we look at, uh, I think um, in, verse, in chapter three, when we look at it later, it tells us that whosoever has this hope in him purifies himself. If our hope really is in not only this dispensation that we are living, but in the one to come, that hope will spur us, will encourage us to actually follow him. I mean, if we look at a lot of the apostles, were they all prosperous? Did they have, you know, a lot of money? No, most of them were flogged. Most of them were imprisoned. What happened to a lot of them? They were flogged. They were imprisoned. Most of them, you know, went nights without food. Or what? Because they believe in the true gospel. And if their faith was tested at that time, our too today will also be tested. And if it is tested, it needs to stand the test of time. So this is my this is really what stuck out to me today, that that message is very simple. We don't need to complicate it. And if we preach it to somebody and they're not interested, you know what? They are probably not you know, a member of that kingdom. If we preach it to anybody and they become interested and, you know, they want to have a relationship with Christ and all of that, that is somebody who is really interested in following God. And in those type of people, we should do whatever is within our power. I mean, for everybody too, we should. But that simple gospel message is a very easy way to determine where we ought to be as believers and where we ought not to be. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Let me quickly say,